interviewing all this week some of the world's leading authorities, researchers, scientists, investigators, government agents, and yes, even theologians on the ramifications of an alien encounter. But now you've heard of Micaiah Kaku and his physics of the impossible. Well, we're joined by the nuclear physicist, original citizen investigator with the 1947 Roswell New Mexico UFO incident tonight, who's internationally renowned for explaining just how the physics of intergalactic travel might not be so impossible after all. I'm referring, of course, to Stanton Friedman. He received his degrees in physics from the University of Chicago in 1955 and 1956. He was employed for 14 years as a nuclear physicist for such companies as GE, GM, Westinghouse, TRW Systems, Aerojet, General Nucleonics, and even McDonnell Douglas on such advanced classified projects as nuclear aircraft, fission and fusion rockets, nuclear power plants for space, and more. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to this segment of Official Disclosure Prepare for Contact, the one and only Stanton Friedman. Good evening, Stan. Good evening. <laughs> Gee, that was an impressive introduction. Uh, one correction, though. I don't talk about intergalactic. I talk about intra within the galaxy. I don't really yeah, well, care about other galaxies. <laughs> well, that's the reason we've got you here, because we need somebody that's qualified to put our feet on the ground. And another thing, we really also want to find out from you uh, tonight the original investigation into Roswell, because nobody can tell the story as the original investigator could, which, i.e., is you, and, of course, your importance. Uh, we're also going to be talking to Jesse Marcel, Jr. here, uh, either later tonight or tomorrow. I forget exactly when we're talking to him, and, and the two of you are also connected in history in this regard. But let's begin by getting your response to this avalanche of recent news. In fact, I've got maybe ten news stories just this week printed out in, in front of me right here, right now, coming out of these um, uh, Royal Academy meetings, the big question, are we alone in the uh, universe? What can you tell us about these meetings, Stan? Well, <laughs> they, they were kind of loaded, let's put it that way. We do have a bunch of very highly qualified people, that is, they have uh, Ph.D. degrees, and they've been published all kinds of things. The Astronomer Royal um, was one of the people, Lord Rees, you know. We, we, and I, I should, to give you a sense of perspective about uh, royal astronomers, uh, in the within a year before the first uh, spacecraft went up, the first Sputnik, uh, the Astronomer Royal of England said that uh, space travel was utter bilge. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a whole long list of these false claims made by very respected individuals. The, the conference, you know, I would like to have been there, although I'm sure my blood pressure would have gone up substantially, <laughs> because the, the the focus was, was so weird. Um, and I, I should <clears throat> give credit where credit is due. The reason for this conference was this year is the 50th anniversary of Frank Drake's first attempt to find a signal from an alien civilization. You notice I said a signal. He wasn't looking for aliens. He was looking for a signal. It could have been an instrument that was set up a long time ago and is still broadcasting, you know, and there ain't nobody there minding the store. We don't know. Anyway, it was 50 years ago that he did the Project Osmos search, and Frank was one of the speakers there. And I'm glad to see somebody even older than I am standing up <laughs> in public. <laughs> Uh, Frank's 79 now, and uh, what was strange to me was some of the silly arguments that were made. Um, some people saying that, look, there's no point in listening for signals, and I tend to agree that there isn't much point in listening for signals because the whole SETI movement doesn't make much sense to me. I call it silly effort to investigate. They can yeah, I know as to how I feel. <laughs> um, <laughs> But so I, I agree with that end of things. But other people are saying, hey, what we need to do is look for microbes here on Earth. We have been finding them in strange, unexpected places, you know, where it's very hot or where the pressure is very high or in rocks or where it's very cold. And uh, these life is pretty strong stuff, apparently, it can handle all kinds of conditions that the smart people said couldn't possibly be places where life was found. 
And there was one unique idea. A woman said, uh, a scientist said, uh, we should be looking for arsenic-based life, perhaps, because then we know it didn't originate here. Uh, arsenic and phosphorus are very similar in their, some of their chemical properties. Uh, and so, you know, if we find out in some strange place a uh, life that's based on arsenic, maybe it came here from someplace else. And other people are saying, no, 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 we shouldn't look here. We should be looking on Mars. Of course, that's the guy who's head of the Mars observation program. <laughs> I guess he's got a vested interest. Um, and then, of course, we have the astronomer Royal claiming that uh, it's a fact that Earth hasn't been visited. Now, I've tangled with him before in print anyway. I do a monthly column, and I pick out uh, <laughs> nasty, noisy negativists to give a hard time to often in my column. And he was certainly one of them uh, because he said some really dumb things. It, it's, a, it, it's a fact, he said, that we haven't been visited. Uh, you know, a fact. Based, how do you prove a negative, you know? Uh, he said, I'll quote, the fact that we haven't been visited doesn't imply aliens don't exist. Of course, he gives you no basis for this. And he said, some already think aliens have visited us here on Earth. In the 1990s, people claimed the favorite alien visiting card was crop circles and cornfields. And some aliens apparently came to a bad end in Roswell, New Mexico, where dummy-like corpses were allegedly photographed. Along with most scientists who have studied these reports, I'm utterly unconvinced. If aliens, he's really saying that he hasn't when he said that, but if aliens really had the brain power and technology to reach the Earth, would they merely spoil a few cornfields? You think about this, and this is some of the silliest stuff I've heard from an astronomer royal, and he's got a lot of competition. I mean, look, I've given over 700 lectures about flying saucers are real, flying saucers and science. Uh, I've never used crop circles as a basis for saying they're real. I don't know any other scientist who has. Uh, furthermore, why would he think that their purpose in coming here is to produce a cornfield? I mean, to spoil <laughs> the cornfield. You know, pe the reason people were driving cars back 100 years ago was to scare horses, wasn't it? I mean, it's a side effect, but it doesn't mean that's the purpose, for goodness sakes. That's a good point. And so, you know, it was one of those silly things, and... I've always said there were four basic reasons, uh, four basic rules for the noisy negativists. One was, don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. He certainly illustrated that. And when I talk about Roswell, I never talk about pictures of, uh, what was that crazy term? Uh, Dummy aliens. corpses. Yeah, corpses were allegedly photographed. Dummy-like corpses, yeah. Now, it takes a dummy to say that, because I've never said that we photographed them, and certainly the corpses weren't dummies. That's the Air Force explanation. Crash test dummies. And the trouble is, of course, when you look at the evidence, which the noisy negativists don't, uh, that none of those were dropped until six years after Roswell. And according to the man who was in charge of the program, I spoke with him. All the dummies were six feet tall and weighed 175 pounds. They were the same size as pilots. Oh. How do you morph that down to a four-foot little guy with a bald, big bald head? I mean, <laughs> where does this come from? Mm -hmm. So that set the tone in some ways. Uh, and, you know, Frank uh, Drake, Dr. Drake, um, has estimated that using the Drake equation, and I don't even think it is justified in calling it an equation. An equation is something that it's a relationship between different factors and different people use it. They come up with the same numbers. Well, one of the key factors, for example, a multiplier at that is the lifespan of a civilization. Now, we've got a big galaxy here, over 100 billion stars. We have some information about one civilization, our own. And from that, you could intuit the average lifespan of a civilization? I mean, come on. That's not science. That's throwing darts at a dartboard. You know, put a bunch of numbers up there, and we'll say, here, try it. you try it. Now we'll get a different number. 
He's saying there ought to be 10,000 civilizations capable of sending out signals. Uh, you know, they've got to develop life. The life has to develop technology, and then you have to get to the point where you can send out radio signals that the SETI cultists, as I call them, can pick up. <laughs> now, 10,000 in the whole galaxy, there's at least 100 billion. Some say 200 billion, but you know what's 100 billion between friends. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, that, that means that within 1,000 light years of here, there were about 16 million stars in that distance. So there ought to be one or two. Uh, big deal. How are we going to find which one is which? My view of the situation is drastically different because I do not assume that absence of evidence is evidence for absence. These guys haven't come here and talked to the SETI cultists, so therefore they don't exist because, of course, they would if they came here. You know, that, this is nonsense. This is ego. This is arrogance. This is an attempt to keep getting funded, uh, you know, which is what it's all about in the ancient academic world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and for, and for that purpose of getting funded, you know, now there's a new story. These are all being spun out of this uh, series of meetings by the Royal Society two weeks ago. And then again this week, Drake, uh, now there's a story, Drake wants off-world listening posts for alien messages. You might have saw that new story. There's another yes. one that came out. I think yesterday there was a story came out where Lord Martin Rees, uh, the headline out of the Telegraph, Royal Astronomer, a aliens may be staring us in the face, and the idea that we wouldn't even recognize them if they were. Are you? Do you? Uh, do you take any? Um, uh, is there anything positive in the fact that at least to some extent the scientific community has at least started talking about what you've been out there for two decades talking about? Four decades. Come on. <laughs> Four de Oh well. Okay, I wasn't going to give it up, but yeah. Nineteen. Well. Nineteen sixty-seven was my first lecture, and wow. I even provided testimony at congressional hearings in nineteen sixty-eight. So that's a long time ago. Well, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, I was glad to see that the coverage, most of it, was pretty straight and pretty sensible, and I was also glad to see uh, Ted Peters' uh, paper. Uh, which I have since obtained a copy of, about the effect that uh, knowledge of alien contact would bring to religions. Mm -hmm. And he's, had a, he's a theologian, uh, but he's had a long-term interest in UFOs, and he's in Berkeley. Uh, and uh, he did a survey of a lot of people and concluded that there really wouldn't be much upset to most religious people to find out there, there had been contact, uh, you know, we've gotten a signal from an alien civilization. Now, uh, I've been in touch with Ted, and uh, I'm waiting. I've got some questions for him, because I think the way the questions were asked is all important, and it was in the terms, in the sense of SETI. In other words, if tomorrow's newspaper says, Signal received from a certain star system uh, 617 light years away. Wow. Would that upset anybody? Probably not. Because what impact would it have on their religion? If, but, what if however, an, what if, but what if an Independence Day type craft suddenly was hovering over the White House? That's exactly the point. Or during the Super Bowl or, you know, something like that. And Or if somebody said, hey, three kids down the street were abducted from their schoolyard by an alien craft, and they haven't found the kids yet, uh, that would be an altogether different reaction. I would, would lead to an altogether different reaction. So, you know, I'll, I'll wait and see on that, because I think you have to, when you say knowledge of alien existence, there's the theoretical and there's the real world. You know, and I, I yeah. think it matters. Uh, well, and I think in, I think in any case, it's it it would be shocking. Uh, I I don't care what your world view is. If all of a sudden tomorrow the sky was filled with some kind of technology that was apparent to everybody, uh, it's uh, I, you know, in in my opinion, it's at least for a little while going to close down the global economy, and everybody is going to be standing there, looking up, wondering, you know, what's going to happen next, and. Uh, some of the some of the early studies from the government covered that, didn't they? That the idea that when oh, yeah. uh, inferior cultures had been faced with superior cultures. Well, and it also stressed that the group that would be this is the Brookings Institute report about forty some years ago, almost fifty now. 
uh, which indicated the group that would be most affected <laughs> would be the scientific community because they would suddenly realize they weren't all knowing, all seeing, all at the top of the heap, and that would bother them more than anybody else. <laughs> but you've been, you have been so objective, um, Stanton. One of the things that makes you stand out to me, and by the way, we could have invited all kinds of other people that I know that were not as important to me uh, as having a gold star like you because you've been so objective. In other words, you've spent just as much time disproving some of the some of the crock in ufology as you have been proving, at least uh, scientifically in terms of theory, uh, what either did happen at Roswell or could happen, did and could happen. And that, I think, has made you stand out as being unique in much of the UFO uh, community. Well, I've done more to show that some of the MJ-12 documents are fraudulent. Of course, the important thing is that some are real, and I don't care about the fraudulent ones once I've established that. You know, if you're looking for white crows, the fact that most crows aren't white doesn't mean there aren't any white crows. And the fact that you find a white crow doesn't mean all crows are white. It means there is at least one. And so I've tried to be objective, partly because I have a weird background. As you read off, I've worked on all these classified programs. That gives me insights about government security. I still find people, some of them ancient academics, who don't believe governments can keep secrets, which I find quite astonishing. I mean, look at the stealth aircraft program. Ten right. years, ten billion dollars? That's a pretty good-sized program to keep secret. You know, and there are a lot of other examples in my book, Flying Saucers and Science. I give a number of examples of multi-billion dollar programs that were kept, whose existence was secret. I didn't work on any of those. I worked on ones where the data was classified, but the program existence was not. But they've managed to keep a lot of things secret. They now, I want, to, I want to talk to you about the history behind Roswell, uh, and I don't want to get the cart before the horse. You know, with it, okay. the subject of the MJ, MJ-12, Chuck Missler, we interviewed him last night. He's a very respected theologian. He referred to your book on the MJ-12 several times, two or three times during that show, as really? being the best objective investigative research into the legitimacy of some of those documents ever. He, he highly recommended your book. So, uh, we I'm glad that to was, hear that. Delighted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, we thought that was cool. That will be in the final set in this uh, series that's going to be commercially available as well. Um, and uh, he talked about how, what you had done was illustrate the legitimacy of how some of those documents probably are most likely legitimate, and then the phony ones are put in there to create the purpose of disinformation, um, as, and this is, of course, a known tactic. Well, we're going to ask you about that question, but to keep the listeners yeah. uh, kind of in the line of thought, let's go back to Roswell uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and tell us the story about Roswell. Uh, how how did you get involved now? Like I said, we're going to be talking to Jesse Marcel Jr. too, if he can keep himself dug out from the snow. I don't know if you've had snow, but uh, his all of his emails to me have been about <laughs> being outside trying to keep himself from being buried in the snow. We've had a mild winter back here in eastern Canada, <laughs> believe it or not. It was uh, above freezing today. It's, it's unheard of, but it was there, and the snow's melting. Wow. Last year we had 13 feet of snow, so uh, I'm just as happy that we haven't had a lot. <laughs> well, take us back. Um, okay. to, you know, how, what, what happened? How did you wind up going to Roswell and uncovering what has become really the, the biggest story, perhaps the biggest cover-up in, in, in UFO um, uh, information in all time? Well, okay, it, it, I didn't go to Roswell to do this. Uh, I've been there many times since. I will be there this July for the annual festival, of course, and give three or four lectures at the museum. Uh, in the early 70s, I heard about a, a sighting in California. A colleague and I was living in Southern California. We talked to a forest ranger, and those guys have a lot of sky to look at. And he had had a good sighting, but he said, you really ought to talk to my mom. So we talked to his mother, who told us about her sighting in Albuquerque area. And somehow it came up that when she was working at a radio station there, uh, they had had a call from their Roswell affiliate. She's in Albuquerque. And a saucer had crashed, uh, she was told. And the guy, wanted, the guy from the Roswell station wanted to put the story out on the wire. And it was, the wreckage was going to be sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. 
And so she was a good typist. She wasn't a journalist. And he's dictating, and she's putting this on the news wire. They didn't have the wire down in Roswell. They had to send it up through uh, Albuquerque. And suddenly there's a ding, a bell goes off on the machine, do not continue this transmission, FBI. And she asks the guy on the other end, what do I do? He said, don't transmit anymore. Well, she remembered some of the people, some of the names. I tracked down a few people. Her name was Lydia Sleppy, incidentally, and I've talked to her since that time, of course. And uh, I tracked down a number of people, but I hit a stone wall. Some people didn't remember, whatever, so I filed it. This is in the early 70s. In 1978, I was in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, doing three interviews, I thought, at uh, the big television station uh, to promote my lecture that evening at Louisiana State University. And incidentally, Jesse Marcel Jr. went there, I believe, at some point in time. He he wasn't involved in this at the time. Anyway, I'm... I did two of the interviews. The third interviewer was nowhere to be found, uh, no cell phones at that time. And the station manager is giving me coffee. He's looking at his watch. He knew the person who brought me to the station. He knew I had other things to do that day. And out of the blue, he says, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. And being the brilliant investigator I am, I said, who's he? <laughs> he said, oh, he handled, his next sentence really threw me for a loop. He handled wreckage of one of those saucers you were interested in when he was in the military. What? You know, oh. he's a great guy, lives over in Homa, Illinois, at Homa, Louisiana. I didn't know where Homa was. I've been there since to talk to Jesse Sr. And um, uh, we're old ham radio buddies. Give him a call. Yeah. And then the other reporters showed up. I did the interview, had a great crowd that night at the university. I'm at the airport early the next day, check information in HOMA. And uh, sure enough, there was a Jesse Marcel and only one. And so I called him and told him Johnny Allen's name and stuff. And you see, Jesse Sr. was one of the few people who could not possibly deny that he was involved in that event because his name is in the papers all over the place. His picture was in a lot of papers. So he couldn't say, oh, I don't know anything about that. You know, So he tells me what he knows. He didn't have a precise date, but he was the intelligence officer at the Roswell Army Airfield, later Walker Air Force Base. Uh, and he was there on a Sunday when he gets a call from the sheriff uh, that a rancher had come in, sheep rancher had come in with some crazy materials and he said there was a whole bunch of this stuff out there. He doesn't know what it is. And it turns out there had been articles in the paper a couple of days earlier, which uh, the rancher just found out about the day before. The rancher lived out in the boondocks. Uh, and I mean, Mac Brazel, 10 miles from the nearest other place, you know. Uh, and he didn't have a phone. He didn't get a daily paper. Didn't have running water. You know, I mean, he had his own well and stuff. Didn't have electricity. Uh and the rancher had come in with this stuff, so Jesse checks it out, uh, talks to his boss, Colonel Blanchard. Uh, this stuff is weird. And the colonel says, check it out. When they said there was a whole field, huge field of this stuff, take one of our counterintelligence corps guys with you, a guy named Sheridan Cabot. Now, that's important because Colonel Blanchard, the base commander, was – especially concerned about spying. You see, he was head of the 509th, the only atomic bombing group in the entire world. They had dropped the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They had dropped, uh, tested two more at Operation Crossroads in the Pacific in 46. So New Mexico was loaded with classified activities, uh, not just at Roswell, but two of the three nuclear weapons labs in the United States are there. The biggest employer in the state was Kirtland. We were testing the captured German uh, rockets over at White Sands. Uh, any spy worth his salt would want to be there, and we found out later they were at Los Alamos, uh, Klaus Fuchs and the Rosenbergs, who got executed for spying, you know, treason. Uh, people mm -hmm. forget that, I guess, when they're not as old as I am. <laughs> anyway... Jesse and Cabot follow the rancher out because no way to tell anybody how to get there. Uh, they spend overnight in their sleeping bags. He gave them a can of beans, Jesse told me, the rancher did. 
The next day they go out to see the debris field. They find this huge area, maybe half to three-quarters of a mile long, a few hundred feet wide, strewn with weird stuff. Now, Jesse had seen crashed aircraft. He had served in the Pacific. There wasn't anything conventional there. He told me that the first time around. No wires, no vacuum tubes, no tags saying made in Oshkosh, you know, no propellers. Uh, this was weird. He also figured out, because this, there was no crater and the stuff was strewn out over a large area, there had to be a mid-air explosion. Because when an airplane goes in, boy, you dig a nice big hole in the ground, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so they come back to town. Uh, Jesse wakes up his son, Jesse Jr., who he'll be talking to. He was 11 at the time. Uh, and shows him some of this wreckage. The next day, he goes and takes it in to the base for their morning meeting, and Colonel Blanchard gives two orders. He says uh, to Jesse, get one of our B-29s to take you and this stuff to our headquarters, that's 8th Air Force headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas, on your way to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. That's where, that's where captured enemy equipment was normally sent. That's not an unusual place to send stuff, in other words. He gives a second order to Walter Haupt, the base public information officer, put out a press release saying we've now got some of these, or one of these flying saucers that people have been seeing. There had been loads of sightings, a couple thousand in the previous two weeks. This was the end of that, in other words, the peak of interest. The weekend of July 4th was just jammed with articles all over the country. So they both follow instructions, of course. The B-29 takes Jesse and some of this wreckage uh, to Texas on their way to, ostensibly, to Wright-Patterson. But at Fort Worth, Texas, Colonel Blanchard's boss, General Ramey, head of the 8th Air Force, mind you, tells Jesse, you don't say anything. I'll take care of it. And he told the press that... Uh, there had been a mistake made, just wreckage of a radar reflector weather balloon combination, nothing to worry about. Now, if you look at the newspapers, the New York Times didn't have the story because the press release didn't go out until noon, New Mexico time. But by 4 o'clock that afternoon, Texas time, the cover-up story was already in, and the Los Angeles paper had both. Army captures flying saucer. General thinks it's radar weather gadget. The next day, Ramey empties Roswell's saucer, and that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. But loads of coverage in between. It wasn't just in the Roswell paper. Chicago Daily News, Sacramento Bee, Los Angeles Herald Examiner, San Francisco Chronicle, etc. Lots of others on the etc. And well, so, and 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 also since then, hasn't there also been a? Uh, I mean, there've been a very large number of those very people who were there, the people who were on the ground, who were who participated in the recovery of whatever occurred there. Many of these people, of course, had top secret security clearance; they were under oath oh, yeah. to remain silent. But many of them, as they near death and realize that, okay, I got one foot in the grave; these people can't hurt me anymore anyway. Now they've come out and told a different story. Well. I wish there were more. We found, uh, I shared my story with uh, Bill Moore, and we. I had another story at another lecture in Minnesota this time where somebody else told me about a crash. We pooled our uh, efforts. He had a third story, an English actor, Huey Green, driving across the United States from Los Angeles to Philadelphia while in New Mexico heard on the radio about a crash saucer in New Mexico. Huey thought there'd be a big deal when he got back to Philadelphia. Nope. Well, he could pin down the date because it wasn't a trip you made very often. You can imagine what the roads were like in 1947, <laughs> July. And uh, Bill went to the University of Minnesota, where he was based, uh, library, started looking at the newspapers. There was the story. Verified what Jesse said, gave us all kinds of other names. In the next year and a half, we found 62 people in conjunction with Roswell. This is before the Internet, you understand. So my phone mm -hmm. bill and his phone bill were running pretty darn high. Mm -hmm. The first book came out in 1980, uh, The Roswell Incident, by William Moore and Charles Berlitz. I got a cut of Bill's uh, earnings from that. Uh, by 1986, we had found uh, a total of 92 people. 
And I instigated the Unsolved Mysteries program in 1989 on NBC. 28 million people heard that show the first time, 30 million the second time. We got more leads out of that. And there is a video. This is listed on my website, which is being attacked by some nasty person with viruses. So hmm. I'll give you the it, – it's www.stantonfriedman.com, but wait a couple of days. <laughs> Uh, unless you like viruses. Some people want to fight the viruses. Anyway, there is a DVD with testimony from 27 first-hand witnesses, including Jesse Marcel, Jr. Most of the other people are dead. He was. What's the name of this DVD? Recollections of Roswell, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, and uh, it, it's got... People want to hear firsthand or see firsthand, mm -hmm. and this is the way to do it. And there has been so much garbage put out about Roswell. I, yeah, I'm appalled, and I'm, I guess I shouldn't be. I should not be surprised at all. Uh, the head of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry says, oh, that story was because the PR man, he didn't know his name, uh, put out the story to get attention. The notion that Walter Hout would put out a story saying that they had recovered a crash flying saucer is absurd. It's a high security place. He'd be in the brig in you know, no time flat. Uh, it makes no sense. Uh, there are other statements like that. Uh, one guy said, well, Jesse Marcel Sr., uh, you know, he got paid by the National Enquirer to come up with this story. Where the heck does that come from? <laughs> So uh, you spend a lot of time. There are some other good books besides mine, Crash at Corona, The Definitive Study of the Roswell Incident, but Don Schmidt, Kevin Randall, uh, Schmidt and Carey have put out books, uh, a lot of useful information from people who do firsthand investigation. They don't sit back in their office and make up stories. Uh, mm -hmm. Reason story, testimony from... Um a um, a widow out of Roswell. Barry Cord, C O R D E S. That's right. And just in the last couple, three weeks or four weeks, whatever it's been, she has come forward. And I want to ask you about her. She has told this story. She tried to get her husband forever to tell her what actually happened at Roswell. Um, basically, he said, "If I tell you, I got to kill you." And he wasn't saying it with a smile, but. But over time and before he died, he shared with her information. Now she's out there saying whatever happened at Roswell was extraterrestrial and it was recovered. Do you know anything about this story? Yes, I've, well, I've spoken with her. I sent her a copy of my book, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah. Uh, the, now, you've got to be careful on this story. He never said it was an alien spacecraft, and she doesn't say he said that. He said it wasn't a balloon and that he couldn't find records. He did work with the CIA, uh, U-2 program, trained some of the pilots, stuff. He, he was an outstanding pilot. He was a general, too, incidentally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Better add that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he was not a piker. He, he was not some little guy who had a, a case to make. And, and incidentally, she uh, is the daughter of one of the big uh, landowning families in the Roswell area. She grew up there. Uh, that's where they met, as a matter of fact. When he was he was stationed at Roswell, but he wasn't a pilot at the time, uh, and so he had quite a career after that. I was very impressed. I did some checking on him and you know looking him up, and so she uh, has been willing to say what he told her and what he didn't tell her. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. and you have to. I was very impressed with her. She's in her 80s. She sounded very, very sharp and had it all together. Um, she knew uh, Glenn Dennis, for example, went to school with him <laughs> at the time. Uh, he's the mortician, the undertaker in town uh, who talks about bodies. Uh, and so I, I was very favorably impressed. And the trouble is we're running out of people like her. We're, you know, mm -hmm. we're racing the undertaker, and he usually wins. Right. But the fact that she had courage enough to speak up uh, is part of the picture here. And General DuBose, the highest ranking person who did say that this wasn't any weather balloon radar thing, I met with him. Uh, he was in his 80s, sharp. Um, he also made it clear 
when I uh, one of my last conversations with him, uh, he said, "Look, I like what you're doing, Stan. If I remember anything more, I'll call you. What can they do to me now?" I think he was 86 at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we need more people with that attitude. But I mean, he set up the Air Force's search and rescue team. He had 18,000 hours as a pilot, which is a lot. That is. And, uh, you know, I was very impressed. It took us to the nicest restaurant in town. Uh, and he's on this uh, DVD that I mentioned, Recollections of Roswell. We had to edit it a little. He was talking somewhat about some of the women on the base. But we didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and, 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 well the, I guess the, the point that I'm making is, um, I, the same thing that Chuck Missler was making last night. You you ha, you have you know all kinds of people, all kinds of world views. We're spinning off this whole series from what the Royal Society, but it isn't just them. It's the it's their 280th anniversary, according to them. It's also I think the 50th anniversary of Frank Drake's equation, and it's yeah, also 350 350 for the Royal Society. Can you believe that? Can you believe it? And then also these, this recent polling, you know, of the public at large, and, and it didn't just include questions about would this disturb your religious faith. It was all kind of questions. Yeah. And what it illustrated is that most people in the public now, now they may be delusional, but they are saying that they are willing to accept the idea of an extraterrestrial intelligence, which might be kind of a game changer in terms of cover-up. So... It's very easy for me to believe that between you and every other solid researcher into this field, that what happened at Roswell was not a mogul balloon or any of their other, I mean, and they basically kind of changed their story about every two or three years anyway. You're not going to buy that one. Well, what about this story? And if that don't work, what about that story? What do you think governments want to cover up the UFO data? What's going on here? What, what What has been the motive behind government agencies to want to cover up what has happened at Roswell and and elsewhere. Well, remember now, I am not posing as a spokesman for the United States government. I think that's true. (laughs) Some people say you are. Well, I did once work for the United States Post Office two weeks weeks at Christmas vacation in Linden, New Jersey, as a sophomore at Harvard University. That's it. That's my government service. You have referred to this as a cosmic water gate. That's what I want to know. Why would the government want to cover up this material? There is a piece on my website about U.S. government UFO lies, but... I normally give uh, six quick reasons. One, you want to figure out how the darn things work. They make wonderful weapons delivery and defense systems. That's where we spend a ton of money. Everybody wants to have a better weapons delivery and defense system. You've got wreckage. You set up your secret project. The first rule for security is you can't tell your friends without telling your enemies. They listen to the radio, too, believe it or not, and read the newspapers and watch television. So that's the first problem. Uh, the second problem is the other side of the coin. What if the other guy out there figures out how they work before you do? How do you defend against them? You don't want them to know you know, they know, you know. You know we've been playing this game for a long time, bigger spears, stronger shields, stuff like that. The third problem is, is different sort of a political problem. If the government were to make, if an announcement were to be made, I won't say the government, if an announcement were to be made uh, tomorrow by highly trusted individuals around the world, a little hard to find, but I picked the queen and the pope. How's that for an odd couple? You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> well, they do have big followings, uh, and they're about the same age. <laughs> so forth. Uh, what if they were to say, look, uh, the Earth is indeed being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft, and let's say they say they're neutral, so it's not scary, you know, we're going to be destroyed next month kind of thing. What would happen? Well, I think the stock market would go down. I, I think mental hospital admissions would go up. Uh, I think that there would be a strong response from a lot of people. Uh, church attendance, I think, would go up for some people. There's a fifth reason. Uh, Some people say, look, Stan, if they're coming here and we're not going there, that means they're more advanced than we are technologically. That means soon there'll be new methods of energy production. There goes the oil companies of ground and air transport. There goes the car and the plane companies of computers and communication systems. There goes those guys, economic chaos. 
Well, there's a sixth reason. In the course of my lecturing, I have on seven different occasions heard about more planes, military planes of ours, going up to chase UFOs than came back down. Some of this is discussed in the book by Frank Faschino, Shoot Them Down. A lot of people don't know that in 1952, which was the biggest year in Project Blue Book's history in terms of number of sightings, orders were issued to military pilots to shoot down UFOs if they don't land when instructed to do so. Now, don't ask me how you instruct an alien, get your darn craft right on down now. You know? <laughs> it's pretty silly, but uh, <clears throat> look, if I've heard about seven such instances... There's got to be a lot more. And uh, people say, you mean they didn't tell the families? Of course they didn't tell the families. There's a long history of withholding highly classified information from families. Uh, there's a book, uh, By Any Means Necessary, by William Burroughs, B-U-R-R-O-W-S. About 100, mm, I think it was 60, crewmen of reconnaissance planes that were tickling the radar in North Korea, Russia, and China, mostly after the war, after World War II. Uh, see how quickly the radar came on, you know, and how what frequencies they're using. So if we ever had to attack, we'd know what to do and stuff. A bunch of these planes got shot down. We heard radio transmissions from some of them. The pilots were captured. Some people say tortured. We never said boo until, indeed, 2001, when the government had a, I'll call it a large conference, where they brought in the families. They, they'd just been told that, uh, you know, unfortunate accident at sea, uh, nobody recovered, etc. Then they were told, and they were given the medals that their offspring or brothers, fathers, whatever, had earned. So... You know, that's a long time, 2001, and some of these cases were from the late 40s. So governments will cover up things like that. They have in the past. They will continue to do so in the future. So I don't think the government wants to admit, hey, pilots, oh, we forgot to tell you that those UFOs might give you a hard time if you try to give them a hard time. So what I'm saying is I can see the rationale, and I don't want technical data out on the table. But I do think we, as citizens of a democracy, I put that in quotes, uh, are entitled to know what our, the guys we're voting for think about how we should act toward aliens. Shoot yeah. first and ask questions later? I don't think that's a very good idea, frankly, because the other guy's gun might be bigger than ours, and it's well, not a very civilized way to act either. <laughs> Stanton, uh, why do you think aliens would want to visit Earth? What, what is so special about this planet? Well, you know, in the book Flying Saucers and Science, I think they have 22 reasons for coming to the planet and uh, for aliens to come here. You know, they're graduate students doing their thesis research on the development of a primitive society. Uh, you know, gas food lodging next exit, honeymoon capital, this corner of the galaxy. You know, you can think of all kinds of reasons. Uh, but I would focus on one primarily and one secondarily. The primary one is... I think every advanced civilization, of which I am aware anyway, is concerned about its own survival and security. We spend an awful lot of money <laughs> on such things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think aliens uh, want to keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood who might pose a threat to them, but only close tabs on those that show signs of being able to bother them. At the end of World War II, there were three signs that soon these idiot earthlings, this primitive society whose major activity was obviously tribal warfare. Uh, let's not forget, we killed 50 million of our own kind during the war. We destroyed 1,700 cities. These are not nice guys. At the end of the war, there were three signs that soon we'd be moving out, soon meaning 100 years, which on a cosmic time scale is nothing. Uh, the three signs were nuclear weapons, powerful rockets, the V-2s that Germans were launching at England and killing people with, and powerful radar as an illustration of our growing control of electronics. There was no radar before the Second World War, incidentally. Uh, and, you know, isn't it amazing? The only place on the planet in July 1947 where you could study all three of these was southeastern New Mexico. First atom bomb tested at Trinity site, 
White Sands Missile Range uh, in southeastern New Mexico. That's where we were firing our captured German V2s. We had a whole boatload full of them. We even brought the scientists to test them uh, to do the job for us instead of the Russians. And it's where we had our best radar to track the rockets because sometimes they went in the wrong direction. <laughs> Very, uh, let us say, embarrassing that some of them wound up in Mexico even though they were fired to the north, supposedly. So, uh, now, admittedly, I did have an English astronomer very haughtily say in England, well, they could have gone to the Soviet Union. <laughs> no, they didn't test their first A-bomb until 1949, two years later. So I think the primary reason here is probably to quarantine us. If you were an alien, would you want us out there? I don't think so. <laughs> now, there is, there, there, is, there is a secondary reason. There were all kinds of people who went west to California when it was a tough thing to do back in 1849 for gold and to Alaska in 1898, I guess it was, and to Australia, uh, all three places, uh, searching for gold. Now, Many Earthlings forget, ours is the densest planet in the solar system. I don't mean the people. That's probably true, too. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. uh, a cubic foot of Earth weighs more than a cubic foot of any of the other planets in our solar system. And you say, who cares? Well, that means there are more heavy metals here. When I say heavy, I don't mean lead. I mean, say, osmium, which is twice as dense as lead. And uranium and iridium and tungsten... There's a bunch of these very heavy metals with very special properties. Uranium, 100 years ago, the primary use for this stuff was, believe it or not, was a yellow glazing agent for pottery, uh, dining ware. Uh, we don't, that's illegal now. You can't do that anymore. We have rare earths here, which are very rare, except we need them for all the modern electronics, and the Chinese are cornering the market. But the aliens might have been stealing this stuff for years. There's zirconium. Now, who the heck cared about zirconium? Well, the nuclear navy is built on zirconium structural materials for all those navy reactors. You had to develop a whole industry mm. on, about something which nobody had ever heard of, nobody cared about. So it may be that they have been stealing goodies from under the ocean. There are nodules at the bottom of the ocean. We got over a 1,000 reports of submerged, unidentified submerged objects, if you will, uh, USOs, <laughs> who knows what they're doing down there. So you can think of all kinds of reasons why people travel. Uh, maybe not you and me, but uh, other people travel. And so I think the primary concern, though, is that we represent a threat to the neighborhood. You see, unlike the SETI people, I'm convinced that there are all kinds of civilizations in our local neighborhood. By local neighborhood, I mean within 50 light years. That covers a couple thousand stars. You know that not too many years ago, you would have been told that there aren't any other planets besides those in the solar system, right? right? Wrong. Right. You know, we've been looking. Oh, <laughs> we found them. Lots of them. <laughs> and we've already found 400, and I don't know what the latest number is, 420 was the last number I read. But the... Uh, the uh, Kepler space system is just cranking up, and it's studying a small chunk of the sky. It's in orbit around Earth, but a very elongated orbit. So most of the time it can look out there instead of having to look through the Earth or being in close orbit. And it's already found its first uh, planets. It's an incredibly technically sophisticated thing in terms of you can pick up the difference in light coming from a star when a small planet goes across the face of the star, which is truly remarkable. And this is from, you know, hundreds of light years away, by the way. Well, what would you want to say to this audience now that you've got about two minutes left? What would be your final commentary on this? We're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium, visits to planet Earth by alien systems and successful cover-up by governments of the world. I think it's time we recognize we're not the big shots in the neighborhood. And maybe we ought to try to see ourselves as others see us, a warlike society that wastes its money killing 
total military budget on the planet this year is a trillion dollars. Yeah. Over 30,000 children die needlessly of preventable disease and starvation every single day. It's time to look around and realize there's more to life than our little quarrels down here. That may be the day we start to grow up. Official disclosure, prepare for contact. There's no possible way to separate the study of ufology and history. From Stanton Friedman, and you've been listening to him tonight, the original civilian investigator into the Roswell event and much more. Thank you for being with us, Stanton. This is Tom Horn, and this is Raiders Live News Talk Radio. My pleasure. Thanks. Good night.